cool. We are now live, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome up the first affirmative speaker, to uh, Jess, to open her team's case. In a democracy only engages with a select majority of voters, when those candidates that represent the vote of the vulnerable by minority groups leads to no influence over policy making and political power, that democracy has failed and that is a democracy that negating has to defend. What is our path to victory in today's debate? Firstly, proving that these norms and institutions create better um, policies better sediments either through via representation or via policy outcomes. What are our points to be able to do this? Firstly, about how we get a more representative democracy. Secondly, how we get better policies. First though, some characterization. The norm that um, doesn't exist is that democracy opens on a premise of majority roles. So in our world, the norms looks like a discussion of bills and parts each party endorses. Comparity, it looks like the um, opposing bill not looks like parties opposing the bill, not because of the change that it's making, but because of the party name attached to it. It looks like the infrastructure bill going through Congress where Democrats have a majority support bill, where it passes the bill then has to go through the Senate, where, where the Republicans control it. And rather than challenging the bill um, because of not liking certain elements, they block it because it was a Democrat bill. Secondly, on institutions, it looks like on um, our side, we support MMP. We say that the politician and the party get a more representative of voters they receive, it gives them the influence over policies when they can participate in different committees. Comparatively, systems like first past the post go against these norms and institutions. We see that one party gets an actual say on policies based on getting marginally more vote, um, votes in that given year. But secondly, and um, this underpins our whole case, so it's important, NIG has a higher barrier of to entry for new opposition parties. Firstly, because new parties cannot gain a majority early unless it's like a majority cult or something like that. But because current parties also probably have taken the mainstream voters. But secondly, existing parties can um, monopolize power in electorates they win to ensure they may entail power because opposition in those areas don't get significant power. This looks like gerrymandering of states to get all of their districts as a majority for them. For example, the UK setting up random Innsborough Electric so that Labour guarantees a seat even though the Conservative voters are in that electorate. Moving on to our first point, onto the representative democracy. We need to prove that when only one party with majority of votes has influence over how the country is run, it creates an unrepresentative democracy. But secondly, how we would rather a government which is representative of more of society because that's obviously optimal because it's by the people for the people. So how do we prove this? How do we prove that we gain a better democracy? Firstly, we give meaning to a vote cast for a minority party. So part A of this is these smaller parties cater to minorities because bigger parties want to appease the majority. This looks like systemic racism in the US and other countries continuing um, towards African-American and colored people because they're not the majority of voters and therefore the policies don't want to target them. This means that smaller voters never get heard and therefore their vote is, invalid is invalidated because the party they voted for gets no power. Comparatively, if 8% of people voted for the Greens, therefore 8% of Parliament would be represented by the Green, so these voices get heard. But secondly, we improve voter turnout because of um, because if majority parties are not prioritizing policies that impact the direct life of an individual, that individual is probably unlikely to vote, three reasons as to why. Firstly, voting takes time. If it's a minority community, they're likely poorer due to racist policies and historical losses of wealth. They get stuck in the poverty cycle, so it means that they can't take the time of work to vote, because polling can be ran at absurd times to disincentivize people voting, for example, during the workday when the working class can't vote. But secondly, having to research these policies takes a lot of time and a lot of like complex knowledge of the um, policies because it's not done in simple language because they don't want these different people to vote. But secondly, we tell you that you feel disillusioned because you know that your votes won't matter unless you're voting the, for the majority policy and you won't do this because the party doesn't benefit you in any way, shape or form. Comparatively, when you know the vote will achieve change, the um, minority group is far more incentivized to vote because their voice isn't being excluded. They know that any percentage of votes for the party that represents them will get to that party gaining seats in the um, government. This is extremely important because previously voices which have been silenced are now heard. Because they're heard in Parliament, which has a sphere of influence to enact policies and change, it's likely that you're going to get improvements of the 
treatment of minority communities because they've voted for parties who are likely to want to um, pass bills through to get that change. Or well, even if the bills aren't passed, they get heard, which means they percolate and slowly but surely they will get through. But second, let me tell you that more voices equals more representation. Democracy isn't fair if only 50% of your voices are being heard. And that is what Nick has to stand by, by has to stand oh, by no. because their voter turnout is low. We change that when we allow these voices to be heard. Thirdly, on this point, there's a lack of nuance in candidate policy because for every electorate, no one candidate is likely to be able to represent all of an individual's beliefs, same as no one party can represent all of that country's identity. So what this means is by enabling an ex a spectrum of candidates, we help resolve that prominent issues as more options equals more diversity. So you've got a higher chance of having a greater proportion of voters' individual values being encapsulated by the elected politicians. Comparatively, having a couple of copy-paste candidates because of the status quo bias, and they know that those traits have succeeded in the past, so they want to be appeasable with voters, so they continue those personality traits, means that they get a chokehold on campaigns, um, means that like you don't have a variety of um, politicians. But secondly, these bigger um, political parties, for example, like the Democrats and the Republicans, have a chokehold on campaigns and the democracy because they're the only parties widely known because they've been historically successful, and the oldest, so they're more developed, so they've got more of a foothold. This means that a way in which parties intrinsically are never challenged. Like we told you before, it increases the barrier to entry because you've got very little emergence of new parties because they know they're not going to get the majority vote. At the end of this point, we're able to prove that we get a more representative democracy. I'll take a point now. How will you actually get real political change when you've got a million minority parties in the, in the government all arguing for different things. We tell you that a lot of minority communities' incentives are going to align because at the end of the day, all of the minorities are probably going to be harmed by the same structural ingrained racism. Whether you're Asian or whether you are a person of colour, you're probably being locked out of the job market because people don't like you because they see you as like these structural issues. Moving on to our second point, which is why we get better policies. So what we need to prove is that these attitudes and institutions lead to politicians producing policies that are better for society. So why do we produce these better policies? Firstly, we encourage parties to have discussions about nuances of legislation, which improves the quality of said legislation. Why is this? Because you're able to engage with other parties, which means that you get a variety of perspectives and which are able to influence the bill. And you can make amendments, which may not have been thought of if only the one party was in power and creating the bill, because all of those people will have similar ideas because they're all part of the same party. But comparatively, and very importantly, um, we've got a couple of reasons as to why this is different. Firstly, when the bill is passed, but the harms on the bill that negatively wait so comparatively sorry when the bill is passed but the harms on the bill negatively impact or impose on a minority group's life it isn't accounted for right because there was no one standing up for that minority community because you just had the majority um party in power but secondly when the bill or secondly the bill is not passed whether or not that bill was a good idea isn't relevant because you dislike the party name attached to who did it um but we tell you that even if the bill is good, when you um, say that bill is good and when you endorse it, it means that the elected, um, the party that is in power, so you're like opposition, gets kudos for having this really good bill. And it's important to know that we get rid of this harm because if all parties discuss the bill, they can all have that claim to fame. So you're not actually propping up your opposition and making them look really good on the global stage. So this leads to functional bills being passed with good engagement, like Labour accepting acts complaints, um, for example, by opening up the country more early and using vaccine, vaccine passports and thus boosting the economy. This helps us win the debate as we fulfill the role of political institutions, which to enact policies important, but more importantly, to enact good policies. This is why I'm extremely proud to propose. Wonderful. Um, cool. I'd now like to welcome up the first negating speaker from the Bay of Plenty, Arcadia. <laughs> 
audio good? An effective, efficient democracy occurs when we allow the elected party to do their job without the impediment of an overpowered opposition. We cannot stand for an ineffective democracy. We cannot stand we cannot stand for their side on affirmative today. What we don't support is giving significant political power to opposition parties, for example, a norm of, um, of by coalitions or appointment to powerful roles in the executive, um, for example, head of defense in the USA. What we do support, however, is the status quo where parties are democratically elected into power, but opposition parties still earn seats in parliament. We support an effective democracy. We think this looks like appointment of power according to what people vote for. A ruling party still held accountable by the opposite by the opposition parties in parliament, but not to the point where the opposition parties hold equal power in the elected party. So our main our main thing we want to drive home in this debate today. So what we give you today is three main points. Firstly, why democracy work or why democracy works and how we are presenting it. Secondly, why we can still have an effective and accountable democracy. And thirdly, that it's um, on the upside that it slows effective policy making. And as a fourth a split, why this leads to more political extremism. So we're going to prove to you today is two things. Firstly, prove that we get more effective democracy, or secondly, to prove that we get better political outcomes. Note, judge that these okay. are exclusive to each other, and we can win on either. So moving on to a little bit of rebuttal. Now, a lot of this is integrated, could be clashed a lot, but I'll very simply go over what we heard from Av. So we heard a lot about representation and about minorities being at the brunt at a lot of these policies. Um, about um, about having the, there's complex language and policies, so minorities don't always understand um, it when they're voting because they um, haven't been given the resources of education, etc. Uh, basically, it was a big point about representation. Um, so a couple of things here. Firstly, um, we think it was a little bit interesting they ignored that there's still difference in minorities. For example, not everyone with Maori heritage votes for the Maori party. You can have different political opinions um, within ethnic groups or other divisions well, of point. minorities. We think this is kind of interesting to club them all together. But um, even ignoring this, um, that when they said, oh, um, what we... What major parties actually do have to have some representation of minorities. They use an ex um, they use an example um, of New Zealand. So we'll we'll use New Zealand as well. So with Labour, um, for um, for them to get them, they actually did have to have some kind of representation um, of of minorities because the reason why parties have to have representation of minorities is because they actually want to get in they want to be voted by people All guess right, what boy. voters do include minorities and um and we think that they do have to cater to these kind of minorities um and we see this happen like for example with act appealing to maori votes recently because they are needing more political say even Trump, who's historically quite racist, actually had better laws to help disproportionate incarceration because he challenged the free strikes law than Biden did as a Democrat. Trump, yes, he did change his character and he certainly wasn't revolutionary, but he was actually forced to represent minorities in a way that the Democratic Party didn't. This just really shows that people, even against their own agenda, actually do have to have representation of minorities. And we think this is still somewhat going to happen on both sides symmetrically. Minorities are still going to be disproportionate um, it represented because no matter what, they are always going to be sadly lower voting populace, whether that's because they have multiple barriers to actually getting to voting facilities, lack of the education to have knowledge about voting. And honestly, voting probably isn't even necessarily at the top of their agenda. They're probably working to actually do life. They're not able to take a day off work most of the time because they are the people most affected by poverty and I, I can't take a day off work to go voting. Um, but regardless of the, um, so now I'll move onto my first point on how why democracy works. So the point of democracy is to effectively represent people's views. This is preferable to alternatives like giving unelected um, parties more political say. Crucially, it's not people appointing or electing opposition parties. It's making silver medals as equal to gold. An example of where we've seen this not work for the affirmative is when Winston Peters was given the power to literally choose the winning party and prime, and prime minister because of how close the split vote was. Why is this bad? Well, not only was Winston Peters 
leaders um, of the opposition party, not elected by the people and therefore unrepresentative, but he literally went against the ideals of democracy, something as says they want to promote in this debate, as in having um, equity and fairness. Another example, if we took, go outside New Zealand, is of Obama's second term, actually something they bring up in this debate about Obama, was that um, that opposition with the Senate. So he was a Democrat trying to get policies through that was blocked by the Republicans of the Senate. In comparison, we have a great example where leading parties have effectively carried out being democratic and representative, like with Ukraine's leader, when 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 they've actually still been representative of their people. Um, regardless of examples that we've used, the reason why this worked is because they're elected by the people and they didn't have the interfering clash with the opposition parties. Notice this directly contrasts with our previous examples. Moving on to my second point, why we can still get and have an effective and accountable democracy without giving significant power to opposition parties. So under the status quo, in a most functioning democracies, there are already ways to hold governments accountable without limiting their effectiveness, i.e. by effectiveness we mean the ability to do things like budgeting policy, other duties of the government. Um, three major layers into how we actually get this accountability. Firstly, we still get seats for opposition parties in parliaments. They're still represented, they still have a voice, they can still propose policies, um, but crucially, they do not have the power to override or hinder decisions of the leading party by themselves. And crucially, this representation is of proportionate to what people have elected. Secondly, in all democratic nations, they have some form of outside institute from the leading party. Um, couple, um, examples of where we see this most commonly. Firstly, is with in Commonwealth countries, there's the Majesty's Honorable Opposition in Republicans, uh, Republic, sorry, like America, they still have a dominant party outside the leading party which holds them accountable and these parties are able to met so these opposition parties are still able to rally support from the public and actually hold the leading party accountable and they can get voted in the next election if that's what the people are wanting and thirdly if all of these fail you still have the public the people to vote you out in the next election so you know oh, i'll take a poi how do you not exacerbate extremism when parties don't discuss policies and therefore you're creating new chambers um, we don't think this is going to increase extremism because you're probably giving, uh, first of all, you're probably giving more voice to extremism, which is probably some of the um, smaller parties, not the not all small parties are extremists, but you are giving voice to those ones more so. Um, and we still think that there is still discussion about policies take a long time to go through. And there's actually a lot of things they have to do in parliament having these kind of discussions. It's not that, oh, they just can appoint a policy next day, it's in effect. No, that's not what happens. You obviously have a process, but the difference is you don't have the significant hindrance of literally pretty much getting a veto of like, oh no, we just do not want this to happen. Because if you're appointed at a certain position, you do have the power, like we said with Winston Peters, to literally change the outcome of democracy and at the outcome of my point about this accountability um what's really interesting is by having all these layers of accountability coexist and intersect with the people with outside institutions with the opposition party you actually have many angles to create that pressure under that one cohesive system under our side they want to disrupt this the system leading me nicely on the quickly touching on what we've already talked about significant political power on getting these kind of policies through so you're not able to get those kind of policies through because they are now weak weakened because you don't have a clear direction. You're not able to point where you actually want a policy to do. You're less likely to get them passed because, again, you're going to have the, uh, that hindrance of getting the party group. We, we actually get, get more equitable, equitable and more fair democracy, democracy something that the can't, can't do today. today. They're, they're not re actually representative, representative of the people. people. Proud to negate. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. And I'd now like to welcome up the second affirmative speaker from Waikato, Levi, to continue on their team's case. Sorry, Ailey's just having some connection issues, so she's going to watch on the stream. So uh, if, if she vanishes, that, that she's still watching the debate, still judging the debate, um, she just might not be on the call. Yeah, I did. 
Am I audible? When a party that due to low voter turnouts and first past the post mechanisms only gets 20% of the public vote to that party in the end is then able to rule over 100% of the population that represents a failure of democracy. When 60% of voters are ignored on a practical level because side negating is willing to argue that if they're there, they're actually challenging um, these parties, even if they don't have any power, then they lose today's debate. What we argue then on our side of the house um, is, is on two th points of clash, firstly. First one being on efficiency and effectiveness of democracy. The second one on representation. And thirdly, I'll then split on misinformation. Firstly, then on effect, uh, efficiency and representation of democracy. Look, we've heard a few claims from side affirming at first, so I'll work through these chronologically. Firstly, we hear that coalitions and these, these types of like political um, groups are quite dysfunctional because you have a lot of voices contributing to one thing. Look, we feel like even if this is true, some minor inefficiency, if it goes towards discussing the nuances of a policy and getting more perspectives is still worth it because you're getting a better policy on the other side of that, right? Because the comparative is that one party of similarly thinking people, because they have that partisan mentality reinforced, are all just going, yeah, this is a good idea. We'll push it through. And there's no checks and balances to ensure that it isn't harming those minority groups that say, that 8% that actually gets a political voice on our side of the house actually can intervene on, can actually question and can actually challenge. What we say is that actually normal, normalizing, you know, political voices having a real power to challenge things is good because it's better than nothing ever getting done on those minority groups because that voice ever makes it all the way. Even if that's not the case, inefficiency is a small cost to pay if that goes towards discussions and challenges, which we think are exclusive on our side of the house because of side, um, side negating dismissiveness of these, uh, what this actually looks like. Secondly, we hear that we already get these types of challenges on parliament. Look, note that the reason parliamentary discussions are civil and productive is because of this norm that there are people with actual political power within that structure. If you look historically at previous parliaments, say the Duma in Russia, where it was very easily overrided because you had a bunch of representatives who were there, but none of them actually had any authority to say anything. None of them had any positions to present policy or actually challenge it. They were just an empty voice yelling into a void because that 20% controls the 100%. What we also point out is that the reason, in particular, the New Zealand parliament, which seems to be being referred to here, works so well is because we moved on from the 1970s and 80s first past the post mechanism that saw Robert Muldoon getting 40% of the vote every year and never actually getting challenged because you had those other parties in parliament and none of them could ever actually do anything. That is the reason we went to MMP is because we wanted those smaller parties to actually be able to challenge. This is proof that that type of policy on parliament does not work. Um, the, th the third key push here we get is that giving those smaller parties more of a say is intrusive and bad. Look, if that's what you're saying, then you probably have to stand on dictatorship to a certain extent, where there are no checks and balances around policy within existing structures, because one party and one select group of people cannot represent that whole political spectrum that clearly exists if there are these many voices on your side of the house. Therefore, it is inaccurate for a democracy to say, because that group got at the end of it because of low voter turnout, 20% of the vote, it can therefore represent 100% of the people. We also just say that intrusion as a baseline is probably a good thing on policy, right? Because it stops um, governments and those leading parties from being able to further policies that harm those minority groups. This looks like, say, in the US, um, the Republican and Democrat parties trying to appeal to a majority white population and then never actually having any incentive to do a policy for a minority population. We would rather say Ted Cruz engaged with an infrastructure bill that would have benefited his home state of Texas than just voting against it because he does not want to give any credit to the Democrats or actually acknowledge that they might have a voice because our side gets them a power that forces him to do so. 
What we also hear is that minority groups are diverse. And yes, we agree. That's why ensuring that a more votes, more parties with more power gets better representation, right? Because if you have a bunch of small minority groups, it's very easy for them to get ignored by democratic mechanisms, even though they are the most vulnerable group, they are the most structurally oppressed, because uh, when you only have the majority getting any say, that is why we use this point. What we also hear is that they get accountability without undermining effectiveness. And the reasoning here is that they apparently get many angles. I would like to hear what those many angles are when you only have one voice in actual parliament with policymaking. And when you're quite reliant on things outside of policymaking balances, such as like media attention, which can only go so far when one, when one entity has all the power, right? The reason this accountability means anything is because of those norms of people being able to challenge a leading party's view. It is something that we get on our side. It is something that they cannot stand by and claim as their own. The last push we get here is that extremism is worse on our side of the house. We say, like, as Jess pointed out quite rightfully in a POI, this is not the case because you force minority extremist groups to actually express their political frustrations in a different way. When they feel as though the mainstream democratic mechanism fails them, when they don't actually get a party that is able to represent them or be dismissed or disproven in the public atmosphere, because there's no point in having that party there in the first place if it gets no power, if it gets no representation, you alienate them and force them to act in violent ways. Yes. How do you actually, again, how do you actually get this political change? You've given us these thoughts about how we have lots of minority um, parties, but you haven't actually given us a thing about how they will get a majority vote in order to pass bills through. In because let's say that 8% of, of the New Zealand um, voter base votes for um, votes for the ACT Party, okay? The only way in which the ACT Party is able to represent that 8% minority that you say is if they have political power to influence the bills that go through that. The only way that they are ever going to get that representation is if there is a normal political power and institutions reinforce this, that is exactly what we're standing for. Please engage with the move. Secondly then, on representation, look, what we hear um, as the push is that we need to help represent, uh, we need to represent minorities to get votes. And that is an incentive for, um, for these types of for political parties to ultimately help these people. I'll split more on gaslighting, but there is still that disconnect when you have a smaller group of politicians with power from a smaller, like more niche background, ultimately being the only ones that have power. It's easy for them to one, ignore a minority group when that minority group is not represented or challenged. And two, not actually have any like way to prove viable solutions. Cause you say in the US, you just get like two parties that are very similar. Every single one of them is a rich white guy. How the hell are they supposed to help the poor African-American child? Um, we also think it's quite funny that the ACT example is used here because ACT is a great example of a, of a, um, of a party that is a minor party that is engaging with minority groups to try and get support. And the reason that they see that avenue to do that is because majority parties aren't. That is the exact thing that we are standing for. That is the exact benefit that we get. The last push we get here is on the push of Winston Peters. Note this is one example. Note that this is still led to a greater percentage of the vote making it into executive positions and say if National had gone on 42%. Also note that three years later, Winston was held accountable when he was voted out and the Greens had a continued voice on Labour policies when a norm of cooperation led to the Greens getting into executive positions as a better outcome for, from this example. Lastly, then to run through misinformation, look, I've already proven a lot of this, but firstly, on we get, you get worse gaslighting of minority groups when you only have two parties saying that we're going to help you, but they're never actually attempting to produce policy because it's more politically beneficial to ignore them and to appeal to a majority group. Um, Secondly, it's easy for suppression, such as Alexei Navalny in Russia, having a large support, but having no political authority to challenge him, and instead getting poisoned on the side and everyone just moving on and being like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, and thirdly, just the, there's the challenging of misinformation within structures when 100% of the vote translates to government officials, more government officials, more diverse government officials, equals challenging, equals better democracy. So, so proud to oppose. Pro propose. Yes. Thank you so much for that speech. I'd now like to welcome up the second negating speaker, Peter, to continue on the negating team's case. 
Imagine you go down to the voting booth. You walk into there and find a list of 20 odd parties. So each one is representing its own minority group and its own spin on that minority group and its own specific set of views within that spin of the minority group. And then, and then you read through all of them and find two that you kind of agree with because they fit really well with what you believe, but they have this slight disagreement over what color the buses should be. And so unfortunately, you just can't make your mind up. That is what we are seeing on the AF side of the house today. We are seeing the situation in which they are advocating for hundreds of smaller parties and because they, what they tell us today is that we get better representation through every individual having their own party. And this simply doesn't work. I have two clashes for you today. Firstly, on who gets more representation. And secondly, on how political um, representation actually translates into real change. And finally, I'll deliver you a split point today on why this leads to more political extremism. So on my first point of flash about who gets more um, representation, the main thrust to be today has about how we get more representation by getting more parties into um, into the government representing things in order to form coalition governments. This is not true for several reasons. Firstly, one of the classic problems with systems like this that we see repeated time and time again is that this slows down the political process and doesn't actually represent people's views. We see this uh, in um, systems like the Weimar Republic where lots of parties aren't able to actually represent people's views because they can't stop squabbling over inconsequential things in parliament. Secondly, we tell you that not all minorities align. We've told you this at Arcadia and um, about how actually not all Māori people vote for the Māori party because actually you can't condense everyone into one party and this leads to this like we've been telling you about On these lots of little parties yes sure it's the side that is only giving one party that being the one the most votes all the power is that not the side that condenses minority groups into one party while we may be condensing um the majority into one party we tell you that we get this better representation by allowing members of this party to vote for um these things because this party needs to represent the minorities in order to get this majority vote they need to be able to provide for those minorities in these situations we see like we see this in um some of our big parties in new zealand having yeah. mps who represent specific minorities on their benches we see this um through mps who present specific minorities around in um, specific ministerial positions. And we see this in other um, situations in overseas, like in America, where you see different members of the Senate representing different minorities in these things. And that, so at the end of the day, we, we think we win. They, they, this thrust does not stand and that we these part, lots of parties coming into the government doesn't actually provide this better representation. Finally, they've given us a thrust about how it will lead to more engagement because they people find parties that they feel align, they align with more. This, this is not right for three reasons. Firstly, we tell you, like I said in my intro, people get confused by lots of parties. What we see in these systems where you end up with lots of parties is these people getting confused and not actually knowing which party to vote for. People tend to be more engaged when they're able to find uh, when the political system is simplified in a way for them to be able to understand better what we see when New Zealand switches from the MMP system to the first past the post because it got slightly more complicated we actually saw a dip in voter turnout as people didn't understand the system we tell you that as you introduce all of this more intricate complexity things like this will continue to happen secondly um, we tell you that people end up with similar parties where they can't actually decide which ones they agree with and thirdly we tell you that um people still ended up feeling disinterested because these minorities can't actually effectively represent them because this minority party doesn't actually have sway in the government and they haven't told us how they're going to do this other than forming a coalition which doesn't give the ability to see change. We see this through um, Winston Peters not actually being able to um, put through a lot of um, NZ First policy in the thing. So what have we told you about more representation? We've given you material about how we put people in these, we get people in majority parties to represent these um, minorities. We get, we've told you about how a majority needs to be able to represent a minority in order to gather that voter group and in order to be able to maintain in the top. And so what we see at the end of the day is that we can get this representation at, um, 
on our side of the house and we also tell you about how we get greater political accountability through outside parliament oppositions in the status quo and through people outside of this being able to um, hold the government accountable to representing people that are needed finally on the next on the second point of clash about political representation translating into actual change we haven't actually heard a lot of material from them today about this but most of what they've talked about is about how the main thrust today has been about how parties talking more in parliament will get better input on these bills we've told you at arcadia about how that what will actually happen with these types of things what this actually looks like is parties not being able to do to agree on common ground. The more parties you add into the system, the less common ground there is between these parties because they're so different. This means that they're actually not on able to agree on this legislation. And so you get it falling back to a system where the majority ends up deciding anyway. And so you don't actually, and it, or it, it locks and you can't decide. Um, secondly, we, we tell you that um, differing opinion- D differing opinions stop the common ground from being found because they end up arguing over um, differences that aren't actually affecting the majority of people in the society on this. So what have we told you about this change? We've told you about how you need to have a party that has the dominant um, power in the government in order for that party to be able to enact changes. We have told you that although um, this party will never be able to represent everyone in a society, that this party does represent the majority because that is what the um, democracy seeks to do as a system and that then this majority this party is able to what? act in a way that is consistent and able to en enact actual changes we see that um and so at the end of the day we actually get more policy coming out of the government in order to actually enact changes for the people that are voting yeah. for them finally um we can see examples of this system where um parties and, and what we tell you is that when parties are given these powerful positions outside of um, the legislative body, like for example, in the um, members of the executive, you get situations in like America when in oh, the second um, Obama's second presidency term, where there was an opposition Senate. And so there was a lock between this um, legislative and ex executive bodies. You saw them arguing over things like the debt limit, which simply does not affect the general people in the society and does not translate what? into political, better political representation because they just simply cannot agree on things that shouldn't matter. This finally um, takes me into my split point right. today about how we get how we end up with more political extremism on their side of the house. One of the things that we can all agree is harmful to democracy is this political extremism. This is because it creates more of these extreme views and removes more of the common ground from the people in the society. This exacerbates many of the harms we've told you about today by removing even further common ground between parties because they are tending towards extremes. Point. So why do we get Get more political extremism under their side of the house well simply parties need to differentiate themselves from each other this is again in, in unstable democracies like the weimar republic where you have these um, large amounts of parties you see these parties tending towards political extremism in order to differentiate this you see this again in like for example our very own um, nation where you see uh, parties rising up like the new conservatives where they are tending towards more extreme versions of the ends of the political extremism in order to differentiate themselves from other minor parties and so it, it, at the end of the day what happens is these parties in order to differentiate themselves are tending towards political more political extremism then if we take it uh, further and talk about um in, in situations where there are two majority parties for example they move further away from each other in order to again um, capitalize on the us versus them mentality and so the at the end of the day you end up removing this ability for the government to be able to come together and make meaningful change for its people and so the moot must fall cool uh thanks i thank the speaker for the speech and welcome up um, the third affirmative speaker, Janet, to give to give the last substantive speech of the affirmative case. Thank you. 
Am I audible? Starting my speech in three, two, one. Throughout this debate, it has been unclear what negating is actually defending. When we say that there is significant political power by the opposition party, just very clearly characterise you at first, where outside is like the MMP system, where there are thresholds, where there is a significant amount of power allocated, rather than a counterfactual, which they had to defend, which was this absolute majority, which was this high proportion of wasted votes. When they refused to engage with it by having their first talk about how Labour was so good, as if that was the sub that they were supposed to defend, they lose the debate. I'm going to do three things. Firstly, knock out their polarisation split. Secondly, what side gets better representation? And thirdly, who makes um, who makes more better political policies? Firstly, on polarisation, they just said that, oh, it's going to be more extremist because parties need to differentiate cells from each other. Firstly, A, note that diversity actually increases a spectrum. That means that when you have more opposition parties, when you have increased numbers, as just proved to you due to the lower, um, due to the lower part opposition party thresholds, more parties can exist. What that means then is that there is unlikely to lead to be more extremists because there is a gradation of parties. There is unlikely where parties are going to be extremists. What they have then is that Nick has to defend when there are two set groups that need to go against each other to further differentiate themselves from each other. That leads to more polarization. That material doesn't really stand and can be co-opted by our side. Next then, on what side gets better representation? Their first key claim was that, oh, there's a difference, like difference in minorities. There are difference in minorities. We shouldn't be condensing them. Two things. Firstly, note that they then conceded that they do condense minorities and somehow like can vote together, but then somehow cannot agree. Our response there is that when you condense minorities on their side of the house, what that means is that they or force them into extremely limited mono monoliths when they're necessarily lower number of groups. That means that like the Maori, the Maori people or like, um, you know, people with different political aspirations are swamped up into much less parties which have to have more unified ideals and so there's a lot less nuance when they conceded that they condense minorities they actually lose this point when they get necessarily worse representation right they then try to give us the point on representation and labor right note here that this is tokenization where like they actually get no power it means that like even if you have some sort of representation it looks like Ilhan Omar it looks like AOC them having to concede because Joe Manchin won't pass the infrastructure bill and losing out on all the benefits that they told their like they told their electorate was actually going to help right that means that they necessarily have less representation for my, my minorities because like these minority candidates have to cater to the majorities right on our comparative then, when we on our comparative, what we bring you is that policies mean that like there are elect committees and they can discuss. Minorities then are necessarily represented in terms of having these in terms of having this input, being able to suggest changes because there's a committee of discussion of how policies are implemented. Secondly then, there's a proportional vote. The, the New Zealand context that they try to co-op is actually on our side when we have significant political power, right? What that means then is that we actually do get representation, right? What that means then is that America in terms of like, what they have to defend is like set votes in America where like minorities don't actually get that much representation. So next up then, when we, what we impacted was that we also get higher voter turnout. Crucially, they fail to engage with this, which is so important to a democracy, right? We first told you that there is a sense of empowerment because they feel like their votes are actually counted in the fact, in the statistics in terms of proportions, right? Secondly, we also tell you that like when they try to respond to us by having like, oh, they don't get that many votes anyway, the opposition parties, when they have more significant power, they are probably going to help decide and lower the barriers that come from voting because that in that case every single vote can matter so the opposition parties can actually influence them to have voting machines in the like less advantaged electorates in the worst places that means that people feel empowered what this crucially means is that there will likely be a higher voter turnout firstly due to the lower barrier and secondly empowerment is a very powerful thing when they feel less disillusioned voters will come and that means that voters are participating in a functioning democracy crucially then that that means that we're the side that actually defends representation, actually meaning like having a meaningful democracy where people have these values which matter, right?
And crucially, we can win on this because we're the side that protects these vulnerable groups that are screwed over because they're the side that was screwed over originally because they didn't have this representation. We win this. We win the debate today because those are the people you should care about. But next up on who makes more efficient and effective policies. Their first claim was that somehow they are going to be effective and countable, right? The key claim here was that they're going to somehow have seats for the opposition and it's going to be proportionate to the people who have electorate seats. We've already clarified that that's actually what we're defending because that's just a significant amount of power that these political parties can gain. And, but next, we have two responses. Firstly, if they like, if you have these majorities in these like multiple electorates, they are going to be likely wasted because you actually have no chance in passing these bills, right? Like, they are wasted because of the fact that these infrastructure bills and whatever, they have a simple majority, which is just passed. And there's no discussion at all when you don't give these majorities like a lot of power, right? Next up then is that policies don't get like enacted in nuance because they're simplified to ensure that the majority are willing to enact that. What that then means is that we actually get more effect. We actually get more accountable stuff because we have these coalitions where multiple parties are talking in the same situation, right? We have accountable because we have these multiple parties that are all working together necessarily because they must have a coalition in order to have power. That means that this representation will have better policies because they are more nuanced and help more people. That means that we won't have cuts like in the $5 trillion infrastructure bill because of the fact that they still have these um, opposition, whatever, right? Opposition, like opposition claims, right? The next claim was that minority parties are too many and they don't get political change. So firstly to note that this is a very unrealistic characterization. Note that not everyone can afford to be a politician. It's unlikely that they're going to get so many parties because actually a few of them get exposure. What we actually have on our side of the house is necessarily more than just two. Just clearly characterize you why we're only likely to get like one or like two political parties in the case where they have majorities because of the historical biases, because of the fact that like they don't, um, because of the fact that only like most people know about them. So what that means then is that we're actually going to not have that many more parties, right? Next up is that we also have a higher threshold. That means that the 5% threshold will cut off a still a like lot of like random like political parties that step out, right? What we have on necessarily on our side of the house is that we have a lower threshold so that Latinx, Black, people of colour can all band together. Note that they all have the same and in- similar incentive to like beat the like structural like structural problems that hurt all of them because of the racism that supports white like white structures like in terms of white people having better education having all of these things so that means that they can band together and the lower threshold can actually provide empowerment for these better political change even if it's too inefficient voters are probably going to want to like get it to like get together good policies so they would like to have like coalitions that work together and produce better parties ultimately we're the side that gets better policies because they're more nuanced and also because they're actually still effective where they can band together and we protect vulnerable groups that's why we win the debate today incredible thank you i'd now like to welcome up the third negating speaker for uh ella to give the final substantial speech of this debate. Purchasing him audible. 
in order to win the debate today, Ash actually had to prove to us not only why they get a more representative democracy, but also why they actually get political change for the people that they're representing within that political democracy. Otherwise, it simply does not matter how many new minority parties you make if none of them are ever going to get into power. Two things I'm going to do for you in this speech today. First, to remind you of what we had to do to win. And secondly, bring you two clashes, one on who gets better representation and one on who gets better policy and change. So in order to win this debate today, we had to prove to you either that we get better political outcomes for people or that we got a better, more effective democracy. In order for them to win, they had to prove that not only they get the representation they supposedly want, but also that their representation actually had was able to achieve something and not just be like another little box to tick on the voting form that ends up going nowhere. Let's explain why they didn't win on that today. Firstly, on the point of representation, which they really wanted to hang their hat on, right? What we heard from them was that we get representation when minorities have their own like small fringe parties they're able to create their own parties they we heard that minorities want the same things they feel they're band together and we heard that minority groups will vote for minority parties they tried to bring us like this unique benefit that they get like more accessible voting or get like better like more simple languaging or like more time off so that they can have these minorities voting we tell you this simply isn't mutually exclusive to their side we tell you like under our side of the house we'd still support things like minorities being able to have accessible voting and like having language that is understandable like time off work because like we're still a democracy we still care that people are represented we don't think that one is an exclusive benefit that they're able to claim today but then four key responses on their points that they brought us about representation. Firstly, we told you very conclusively at Peter that like we think it's far better to have a majority party with lots of representation as opposed to lots of small like unique parties who are never going to be able to get into power, right? We tell you it's more we get more effective policy and decision making for minorities because big parties on either side of the house still have like an un, like still have a majority of the power, right? That's why they're a majority party like on either side even under their side where they support like small parties have thing sorry even under their side we tell you that like big parties still have like majority parties still have the majority power we think it's far better if we have representation within majority parties far better that these people have their voice heard where like the majority of the population is focusing their attention rather than like maybe one seat in parliament where someone's oh. able to be like oh don't forget about us and it never actually gains any weight we only really heard at third how these like parties actually get into power they told you like they get in with the five percent threshold like and that serves us we tell you like firstly on this we just don't think that a lot of these minority parties are going to meet that five percent threshold because we don't think on like crucially we'll respond to this later as well but we don't think like minorities are inherently going to vote for minority parties but like just for on that we at the end of the day we just don't think that having lots of small groups having like one seat each is going to get effective what? change let's look into why secondly we tell you on this then like they just never told us how the minority parties get in other than like the assertion that minorities will vote for minority parties three reasons why this crucially does not happen Firstly, we tell you they won't vote for minority parties because they're not confident that they're going to make that 5% threshold. They're not confident it's going to be heard. They wanted to talk a lot about wasted votes. Wasted votes occur when you're not confident that your party's actually going to be able to get in. Secondly, we tell you that like a lot of um, minorities just don't necessarily agree with minority parties. That's why like the Maori party doesn't always get in and like always meet that threshold because we tell you like somebody want to vote for Labour, somebody want to vote for ACT, somebody want to vote for National. We tell you like that's fine. We don't think minorities should have to be like forced into the narrative to vote for minority parties. But like thirdly, even if they do vote for minority parties, we tell you, like Peter told you, it's really, really confusing when you have so many options to choose on all trying to represent your views and you've like never been given proper information about which to vote for because there are simply so many. Like additionally, what if you don't just belong to one minority? Like in New Zealand, you have a huge population that is both Māori and Pacifica. Yes. And like when you have these parties that say they're going to represent like either, who do you vote for? If you like have parents from both sides, you're like, wow, who am I actually supposed to vote for? Under their side, you just have no cohesion. Under our side, we have one party that has representation from lots of different minority groups. Crucially, this means people can get the best of both worlds. We can have rep representation for lots of different minorities rather than minorities having to hope that they get enough representation for their party to get in. That's a crucial harm that occurs exclusively under their side. Thirdly, we tell you like minority 
Groups just want different things. Lots of different parties can't all get what they want. There's a limited amount of political capital within the status quo, like, sorry, not within the state, with like within the system, right? We tell you that if you have lots of parties, very few parties actually get anything because that political capital to achieve change is spread so thinly that you just get nothing. We prefer under our side having a representative majority that can actually get change because that political capital is focused on getting change for these people rather than having to spread it so thinly that nobody gets anything like maybe they get a seat in parliament but if that seat in parliament achieves them absolutely nothing that is far worse off than them like actually getting political change under a big majority party fourthly and finally on this we tell you that like we just get better like worse representation for minorities under their side because if you as extremists who go and create their own little parties like new conservative like that's who they're compared to right they're creating their own tiny fringe parties like big majority groups like see them as these extremists they are more aggressive towards them they don't actually want to include them in like majority decision making that's really harmful for minorities because society sees them as outcasts when it whereas under our side we get that proper um integration we get better practical outcomes because they're seen as like someone who should be given a seat at the table where everyone else is speaking not a high share down on the side that we gave them as a courtesy as f wants to do now secondly let's move into who actually gets better policy and change they told us under their side, well, they searched us that they get better checks and balances. They told us that if they have lots of parties, they get lots of change. And they thirdly told us that parties will work point. together. Those were their key pushes. Firstly, I'll take a point. Why do you think that mainstream policymakers want to settle on complacency in their policymaking if they can just rely on the namesake to be able to garner votes? We don't think that the namesake is going to be able to garner votes, right? We tell, we told you consistently down the line, like democracies work on accountability. If you have a namesake party, you are simply going to be voted out for being tokenistic and someone else who actually does it better is going to be voted in. The key difference under their side is they have to hope that like a tiny party makes it 5% and gets voted in rather than having like a group of like representatives within the main party that likely will get voted in. We tell you this is like an exclusive benefit to our side because Labour and Nasha, for example, if we take New Zealand as like the two big parties are both incentivized to have representative cabinets. Otherwise, they won't get voted in again if they don't have that change. Now, moving on to our responses as to why we actually get better policy under our side. Firstly, we clearly told you, Peter, that lots of parties create ineffective and and inefficient policies because everyone has to agree on it right if you have 20 parties all trying to have their say it takes so long for like a bill to go through because everyone has to read it everyone has to prove it everyone has to have their say we think if you just have like four or five main parties that are already representative you get far better outcomes but like under their side okay maybe they get some representation but nothing actually happens we prefer we actually get action because that's the whole point of politics we prefer to have representative majority parties secondly we tell you we still get accountability um, under our side, particularly from opposition parties, right? Because they will campaign for what people want. If the party currently in power is not giving it, they will like be like, look, here's what we are actually going to do in the next election. They will hold them accountable. They will threaten better policy. So let me tell you, the public also holds accountable by vote, like voting parties in or out. The government has to be a good actor. It has to be representative or it will be voted out. This is something they never responded to. We told you down the line. At the end of this debate today, we tell you that we not only get better representation for minorities, but crucially, we also get action for them, something that F has not been able to do, something we are so proud to stand for on side Meg. Thank you so much for that. Now, as is traditional, I will reverse the speaking order and invite Peter to give the negating leader's reply. So 
in order to win today's debate, AF needed to prove to us not only that um, they got more representation under their side of the house, but also that this translated into more political change. In order for us to win today, we needed to prove that this enacting these changes to the government would be, um, be would be detrimental because either of these things would simply not be true. And today we believe we have proven to you that neither of these things are true. So firstly, on getting more representation into the government, what did, what did we hear from the F side of the house today? Well, most of what we've heard is that they want these coalition parties. However, what we've been telling you throughout today and what, what I made, what I feel I made clear at second and Ella expanded on further at third is that these um, coalition parties simply aren't all that different from a big party. This coalition where all of these minorities are banding together into one essentially big party, the only distinction, the only um, key distinction between these two is the lack of a guiding voice in a party leader, the lack of a guiding thing that it enables the party to, at the end of the day, still get things done. What we also tell you, and what Ella has also um, told you at third, is that what happens is that a lot of these minority parties that they've been telling us about end up being cut out at the 5% threshold, or whatever the threshold happens to be in the other country. This means that actually we get better representation through our big parties, because a, part, a minority that otherwise wouldn't be able to meet that 5% threshold is able to get an MP into the big party, which is able to properly represent their views to the um, majority government. We've all, so what have we told you today about this representation? Uh, we've, we've told you, Arcadia has told you at first about how um, we can have people outside of the government holding the government accountable to these minorities. She's told you about how when the, um, when the government stops meeting its um, needs to meeting its duties to its people and starts uh, mistreating these minorities, they are able to then band together with the other opposition large parties and band together with them in order to remove the government and, or, and do this. We tell you that she has also told you that this, what this means is that these parties are playing for the minorities and giving policy that is in the minority's favor in order to try and bring swing voters over into their camp in order to get this fight minority. Then again, we then at Ella, we've she then at third, Ella has told you about how there's only limited political capital, and that being spread out over minority parties removes their ability to represent people because they lose the political capital to be able to actually um, represent them at a large scale. And so, at the end of the day, we tell you that they actually don't get more representation under their side of the house, and in fact, we get this better representation under the status quo. And so. We move on to the second point of clash about who gets more actual change for people in this debate. So what we have been what they have failed to respond to for on our in our case today is that we have told we have told you about uh, that it is essentially a spectrum. You have at one end you have obviously dictatorships that we don't want because one person holds all the power but are able to make all the change that they want. As you get further and further towards a direct um, democracy where everyone gets to make have their say on every issue, it gets harder and harder to make decisions. This is why we simply don't have coalitions over every decision that the government that we don't. This is this is why we don't have referendums over every decision that the government makes. And so, what have we told you today? We have told you that in order to get this um, change for people um, for people in the government to allow them to continue to be able to function as a government and continue continue to make policy, put out policy, and make changes, we have told you that you need a large guiding voice, a um, governing voice and guiding voice in order to stop discussions where it needs to stop, in order to stop parties from disagreeing over things that are inconsequential, like things like the debt limit in America that simply do not need to be argued over because they do not affect these people that want the change. And so we have won today's debate. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to welcome up the affirmative leader speaker, Levi, to give the final speech of this debate. 
Am I audible? Today's debate is fundamentally about which side gets better democracy. And whether that be on the premise of representation, where democracy is by the people, for the people, on policy outcomes, where a side negating characterizes democracy is about accountability, we win on both these points and we win for the groups that matter most. This is because today's debate falls down to three points of clash. Okay, that's firstly on policy outcomes, secondly on representation, and thirdly, specifically on minority groups. Firstly, then on policy outcomes. Note that side negating from the start is very quick to tie efficiency to effective effectiveness and not actually tell us why. The way in which they do this is they reduce the challenges to harmful policymaking and the checks and balances around the elected party um, that is faced. There is nothing stopping that party then from getting through harmful racist nuances, which we said on our side are addressed when you have those small parties able to influence those nuances, and therefore you're ultimately leading to worse policy, right? We then get told that parliament does this anyway, and I felt like I beat this quite easily when I mentioned the Russian Duma as a front for accountability. Now the reason New Zealand moved from first past the post to mixed member proportional, which is what Jess clearly said is what we're standing for, is because first past the post did nothing for those minor parties that were getting votes. Because, and ultimately the thing is, even if you have that extra voice, we think that inefficiency weighs much less than those harmful policies and less representation. Because what's the point in more policies if those policies don't actually do anything good, right? First, Nick also tells us they come at a policy from multiple angles, and that being one of the key, key benefits. Again, we never actually get told how. We tell you why historically uh, and structural like reinforcement means you only say have two parties that are able to that have the capital and exposure to campaign to win a 50% threshold, which means that you only have that select group of people up as candidates to represent you. It means that you only have them appealing to a majority because the minority is ignored, as we explained. And that these two parties are not pushing for change because they are appeasing the same majority they always have. What we then hear down the line is that these norms facilitate the rise of a thousand different parties as that suddenly being this great conflict. This doesn't actually engage with our fundamental realistic case basis of mixed member proportional. And if this is the absurd take that negating needs to make, they lose today's debate. We tell you that there is literally a 5% or one local representative threshold as Janif Janet clarified at third, and that things like select committees and these types of processes that exist within that are very effective to discussing those nuances as we told you. This doesn't engage with our key push that giving more of a discussion over a four-year term or a three-year term is going to lead to better policy making within that term. That is why we win this point. The secondly, then on representation. Again, the reason this matters is because as Jess told you, democracy is by the people for the people. That means representing more people more accurately across that broad political spectrum that they're getting characterizes is a better democracy. Now we give strong material even on like voter turnout increasing when a vote for a smaller party actually means something because it is much easier to meet a 5% threshold than a 50% threshold. It's a much more encouraging line to meet even if it is still a line to meet, right? That is what these norms look like. That is what we endorse. The exact issue we address that is one party of like-minded people only representing half of the voters at best should not be able to march through pumping out policy that affects all people in society the same way. That is something we stand on that is something we are very proud to um proud to affirm lastly then on spe uh, specifically my minority populations the reason this matters is because we prove to you that this is the most vulnerable group that is most harmed by majority rule democracy. We tell you that this is the group that is most in need of policy reform, and this is the group that is most harmed from the lies of politicians that exist exclusively on side negating, go unchallenged, and nuances and bills that harm minority groups are quickly looked over. Proving to us that Maldi, for instance, but for more than one party, does nothing to benefit your side, because the only Maldi that get represented are those that vote the party that win. That is a problem that you do not solve. It is a problem that you cannot address. That is why you lose the point. That is why you lose today's debate. So, so proud to propose. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, this round is a silent round, so there will not be an adjudication. I think that quiz night is starting at 7.30, so make sure to attend that. I promise the questions are fun and well done to everybody for the past two days. Shall, Shall we, we go, go to, to Rouge Channel? <laughs>